Hi everybody, this is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology. It is February 28th and tomorrow is the 1st of March. So today I'm doing a, uh, a Nightlight video blog looking at the astrology of the month of March. So there's a lot going on this month, this upcoming month, and as, as always, the planets never stop moving and so there's lots to talk about. Uh, what I'm going to do in this video is um, roll through the big transits, right? Uh, you have to narrow it down. You have to pick. You have to pick and choose between the planetary transits. Not all transits are are built equal. Some astrologers, however, have a, a knack for, you know, understanding certain planets and planetary dynamics better than others. And so, um, one thing I always encourage people is to you know check out several different forecasts from astrologers every month because it's not just that one astrologer will get it right and another will get it wrong or that one will uh you know cover the right things and one will you know kind of cover the things that aren't important it's really that as you develop a relationship with the planets and with the language of astrology you also become a little bit like a, a musician you know you know the standards you know how to interpret the squares and trines and you know which parts of the moon cycle to pay attention to and so you're you're like a classically trained musician but then at a certain point of practicing the, the standards, your own, you, you know, your own favorite riffs develop and you start developing a, a relationship with, with uh, certain kinds of themes, planetary ingresses and, uh, you know, talking about the signs or maybe talking about the decanates or, you know, every astrologer will play the music of the month a little differently. So make sure you check out a few every month. I think it's um, important to do that. All right. So the month begins tomorrow uh, with the full moon. So we've got a full moon that um, is very, it's, it's powerful for a variety of reasons. A chief among them is the fact that this full moon in Virgo tomorrow is happening in an opposition with uh, the sun Neptune conjunction in Pisces. So one of the ways that I like to talk about this combination is in terms of there's a really strong call with sun Neptune to connect to something bigger. You know, Neptune is the call of the transcendental in our lives. That can be imagination, dreams, myth, fantasy, um, uh, creativity, the arts, spirituality, but whatever it is, it'll call to us very powerfully. Now, the important thing to recognize in terms of spiritual practice is that not everything that calls to us is leading us down the right path in life. Now, this is not to provoke an atmosphere of fear or doubt. But it's very simply to you know to just remember that Neptune can call us sometimes down the primrose path. Neptune sometimes the ego has lots of things that um, you know it sort of mistakenly identifies as the source or uh, a solution to happiness. You know, and so it, there it's a very like any kind anytime you get a lot of stuff rolling around Neptune, um, exalted planets in Pisces like Venus. Um, you, you have to be careful of the, the longing is healthy the, because the longing is really longing for, for the divine, for, for that which is beyond ourselves. We, we need that. We, we need to connect to that. Our hearts need that. There's a great quote from Jim Carrey that I read not, not long ago where he said, depression is a message from your avatar that you're getting tired of the role that you're playing. <laughs> You know, the, the avatar is like, I'm, I'm getting tired of this, this role that we're playing here. And so, you know, that, and that, so that's what depression is. I thought, that's brilliant. That's really brilliant. But when you're actually in the depression, you, you long for all different kinds of things to solve it rather than recognizing the depression as the voice of the avatar calling you to spiritual health you know, you tend to say, well, you know, maybe a bottle of wine by myself in the bathtub while listening to The Cure, you know, <laughs> you know? and it's like, no, no, don't, don't do it, don't do it, you know, <laughs> and so you can go down, uh, maybe for some people that would be great, but you get what I'm saying, in general, like, you have to be really careful of, like, putting yourself into an environment that's not really going to satisfy the health of your body, mind, or spirit. Now, for me, the cure in a bottle of wine, for some, maybe for some people that does it. I don't know. I don't mean to be judgmental. But for me, that would be a little path of spiraling down into uh, a dark place. So, like, But at any rate, um, but you get it. With Neptune and this full moon, you got to be careful of not being led down the primrose path. Now, Virgo, on the other hand, with the Virgo full moon, another question might be, you're filled with this uh, sense of longing for something bigger. 
And Virgo is useful. You know, Virgo wants to be of use, of service. Virgo is, is practical, concerned with, um, you know, uh, helping and uh, concerned with uh, being thought of as effective and helpful and capable. Those are real concerns for the Virgo full moon. So you put, put that against the Neptunian, you know, the, the sun and Neptune, and you think, practically, this is a full moon that might offer us opportunities to be of service to something beautiful, something bigger that, that's, um, that really fills our heart with, with gladness. And so, you know, think, think right now, how can I practically serve something that is um, transcendental, that's otherworldly, that's a, that's, that represents true happiness, true heart, true compassion, true love, and, and be discerning. Virgo is good at being discerning as well, discriminating. What is, what, where can I actually be of help or service? What is real and what is, you know, some kind of delusion? Be careful about those things right now. Just remember, when Virgo is in the service of a delusion, it's usually coming from the place of, if I do this correctly, if I do this right, then people will love me, then people will value me. And whereas the, you know, the Neptunian Pis Pisces side over there with the sun and Neptune will say, oh, this, this will fill me with happiness finally, you know? And then Virgo says, okay, okay, great. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I got to be perfect. I got to do it right. So, you know, be careful of those, those temptations, but also listen for the call of something bigger, something where you can actually, um, uh, you know, learn something new, put something into service, put something into good use. Now that could be a deeply inner experience or that could be an outer experience. So these transits can work either way. Anyway, that's our full moon. Now, um, <clears throat> let's see, when we roll on to about March 4th, uh, we're going to see the Sun and Neptune conjoin um, in Pisces. So it's just a few days away where they'll, they'll actually sort of get together and pass over one another. And that, that's the same theme that I just mentioned, that, that feeling of the call to greater knowledge, to, to greater cause, to greater purpose, and the possible delusions that come along with it. That's intensifying all the way through March 4th. Um, and then the other thing that is happening around March 4th is Venus and Mercury are getting together in Pisces. And Venus is exalted right now. Mercury, however, is in its detriment and fall. It's really interesting. The potential of that combination is one of doing deep and difficult communicative work to heal wounds in relationships. So Venus is a great diplomat, deeply compassionate, and almost doesn't have to speak at all, you know, in the sign of Pisces at times. It can just give you a glance that's healing. Venus can just give you a feeling that, that mends something. So Venus in Pisces is very powerful in that regard. Um, and Mercury, you know, Mercury in, in Pisces, also not always the, the greatest with words and language. Harder to put some intangible things into words and language. So the, the two of them get together. There's a weird way in which relationships can experience whether that intangible level of healing the stuff that you can't talk out but somehow it gets solved so look for that because that's a really beautiful level of the mercury venus uh conjunction on the other hand william Lilly famously said that ex you know sort of ex he was talking about exalted planets found in the angles of charts venus when he said you know something along the lines of i'm going to misquote it but it was something along the lines of exalted planets in the angles overestimate themselves so it's like a vain person a person who's puffed up full of themselves so venus and mercury can also be that that flowery overly certain speech and you know trying to be so eloquent and and beautiful and flowery but it's sentimentalism so be careful of that. That's there as well. The possibility for distortions to exist because of sentimentalism. Also, um, we have to be very careful about the what attracts us, right? Venus is attractive, but not everything that attracts us, again, is necessarily good for us. And so you always have to be careful with Venus and Mercury that you're not justifying unhealthy attractions in your mind with faulty reasoning, distorted logic, manipulation, persuasion of the mind to yourself or to others to justify some kind of desire, some baser desire that's puffed up in the costumes of greatness. Now that's all, you've got to be careful of that with Venus Mercury as well. All right, so we roll along into, uh, let's see, like March 5th into, or late March 5th into early March 6th, Mercury is going to cross into Aries. And on March 6th, Venus will also enter Aries. 
So there, there's Venus and, Nept Venus and Mercury following each other then into the sign of Mars, a very a fiery, masculine sign of spring. It's youthful, it's, it's impulsive, it, it's, it's much more um, put the pedal on the, on the, on the gas, or put, the, put the foot on the pedal and just and, and go. Um, so you have to be careful with Venus and Mercury entering, um, uh, Venus and Mercury entering Aries for confrontations, battles, debates, hostility, short tempers, um, all of that kind of overly fiery, overly agitated mental and relational stuff. Venus in Mars's sign is always in her exile. It's difficult for her to operate in Mars's zone. She likes to bring unlike things together and harmonize them. Mars likes to slice things apart. So it's difficult for her to operate in Aries. She can. She does do a great job with it, too. She would be really innovative ways of marrying those themes together as well. But generally speaking, there's more of a tension there. So you're looking at, you know, that tendency. Like, you, you're trying to get along, but you just keep finding that edge. Um, my, when my wife and I go into that together, that space where we're really edgy with one another for a period of time, we always say that we're missing each other. <laughs> you know, like we just keep missing. We're trying, like eh, I'm trying to, like you know, be a diplomat. I'm trying to, like, be your loving spouse, and but we keep missing each other. And it, when that happens, I think a lot of relationships go through patches like this, right? And when that happens for us, that's how we talk about it. And then eventually we get through it, and we're connecting again. And and you know, diplomacy doesn't take so much effort. But when Venus is in Aries with Mercury, uh, again, that happens late March 5th and early March 6th that they ingress. Um, you're looking at that kind of tension coming together, especially communication and relationships. Now, on the other hand, that planetary combination is wonderful for putting ideas out there that are bold, fierce, determined, courageous, for the power of the feminine to step up and be its own advocate or to advocacy on behalf of women's issues the goddess in the sign of the warrior. And then you also have Mercury, the scribe, the thinker, you know, uh, inventor of the lyre. So the idea of fierce art, of uh, art that speaks truth, of beauty that has a function or a role to play, like a, you think of beauty and technology. How, how do we make our technology more beautiful? I just posted a video on my wall that you can check out in India, in Mayapur, where I was um, sort of studying and practicing um, bhakti yoga when I was in India, it was such an immersive, amazing experience. And when I was there, they were in the process of building this great Vedic planetarium, the dome of which is actually going to be the, the largest dome in the world, bigger than even the Vatican. And the inside of the dome is filled with layer upon layer of the Vedic planetary cosmology from one of the great Puranas um, uh, called the Bhagavat Purana. This was just a really amazingly beautiful construction. And I just missed, uh, just uh, like a few days after I left India, they, they adorned the top of the temple with the crown chakra um, uh, installment. And so you can, uh, the, the Sudarshana chakra was in, installed, right? And I put a video, you can actually watch it. And when, when they did that video, when, when they shot the video, I'm pretty sure they were probably using drones with cameras to go around the city. And, but they had this amazing, like, basically, like, um, festivals and, and prayers and offerings. And they're dumping, you know, coconut water and, um, and, and oils and, and flowers over the chakra, which is this massive thing. And they're up on, on the platform, the dumping stuff on it and praying over it. And there's this massive fire roaring. And, you know, and every, there's kirtan going on. And it's like, so beautiful, right? And um, but the, you know the interesting thing is that um, that it, when I when I saw that I just thought, oh gosh, don't we need technology in the world? Don't don't we need a little bit more of our technology? I mean the buildings, the structures, the way that we the the kind of the the structural stuff and the functional stuff that we have to use. Like, couldn't we use a little bit more intentional adorning or designing so that that stuff in our world reflects divinity. You know, there's so many religions around the world. Wouldn't it be nice to see more of the art and beauty of the different ways that people aim toward the divine and all these different traditions, like in our city and our architecture and our, like, I just feel so hungry for that here after being in India. And then as I was reflecting today, making my, you know, my notes on Mercury and Venus crossing into Aries, one of the things that I, I love about Venus and Aries is that, um, when, when Venus is put to a purpose, 
right? There's an, there's an alchemy that Venus is in the service of. Remember, Mars is connected to things like science, medicine, cutting, penetrating, going deep into things. It's, in India, they associate both, um, both Mars and Saturn, for example, with mathematics and science. And I, that's something I learned while I was there. It was like, oh, makes, that makes total sense. I mean, I, I would think of Mercury right away, but of course, Mars as well. When you have Venus in a Mars ruled sign, one thing that sometimes comes up is um, the idea, in other words, of some some level of our technology, of our of our purposefulness, Mars, um, uh, being adorned and beautiful. And so, when when you can marry together the effectiveness of something and the intention of something with beauty, um, and then and it can be intelligent. Um, you communicate something much bigger than just the functionality of whatever it is that you're using. So, for example, and this is a really st- kind of stupid example, but I was just thinking like, you know, um, think of all the, the daily things that you have to use. Like, okay, here's a good example. In New York City, the subway styles, right? The the turnstiles of the, in the subways. You go through them all the time and they're like just this functional thing, right? So, in a sense, it has that really like, that kind of like it's a structure, it's a, it's a, there's Saturn, it's got a function and it does something. There's Mars, right? Where's the beauty in it? There's no beauty in it. There's no Venus there, right? So one, so I heard about this project. I don't know if it ever happened, but it, once upon a time I heard about a project where someone was trying to make the turnstiles in New York City for the subways play music so that every time you flipped it, it would play like a beautiful note. And then in the subways, all you'd be hearing is like ting, 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 and, and these beautiful notes like rising through the air. That's, in a sense, that's Venus, that's turning the sort of ugliness, just the like rote, effective, do this of, of a Mars ruled sign, right? It's very masculine, like, I'm going to do this, right? But then adding this, this layer of beauty to it. So thinking about that as Mars and, uh, uh, as, uh, excuse me, as Venus and Mercury travel through Mars' sign in the next month as well. All right, so, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Let's see, Um, around March 10th through March 13th, uh, Mercury and Venus will move through square aspects to Saturn, and that's Saturn and Capricorn, at which point what you're seeing there is the the same energies that I just described are going to be going through uh, uh, the the square, the the challenging square from Saturn, and Saturn will be dominating them. It's in what we call the superior position. It's prior in zodiacal order. It's looking forward at them while they're their backs are sort of turned to uh, Saturn. Now, um, now that's a con- that's a concept from Hellenistic astrology. So if you don't totally grok that, don't worry about it. Um, but basically, if Saturn's dominating those two, then you have the potential for some real dogmatism to come through here. Um, principles governing relationships and uh, uh, principles and intensity and will. Right, so those things coming together, it's, it's it's intellectual, it's mental, it's it. So you think one of the real themes that could come up could be the way that uh, principles are shared, disagreed upon, uh, or or do they come together or not within relationships? And that's rolling through March 10th through about the 13th. So Mercury Venus about communication in relationships, for example, and then Saturn, you got your form, your structure, your your principles, your your tradition. And they're going to be in a tense dynamic for a little bit there. So it's very easy to step into like, you know what's going to make my ego feel really special is if I enforce my principles and standards on everybody that I love. If they all conform to what I like and believe, then, you know, I'll be really happy. And I'll convince everyone that I'm right. And then, you know, the world will be a better place. Right? Like, you just hear Saturn, like, you know, (laughs) sort of, and and then sort of enforcing itself on, on Venus. You want to be very careful of that kind of control, dominance, heaviness, conservative qualities uh, in relationships. On the other hand, Saturn and Venus coming together with Mercury can be about mature, difficult, but mature steps forward in relationships. So you've got Saturn, planet of great maturity and wisdom, uh, impressing itself on Venus, Mercury. That edginess in relationships, that's like, nah, we're just tense, we can't quite we want to be working it out but there's a real edge and a feeling of competition and then saturn comes through and says hey guys i'm like the grandfather who's going to sit sit down here and you know give you some just some old school simple advice that simmers everything down because earth is 
cold and dry. That's going to bring the fire down a little bit. On the other hand, the fire can feel like you know something's trying to control it and squelch it and and whatever. Sometimes people also try to hide the fact that they're very angry or that they're a, actually a, a really conservative, controlling person um, by uh, trying to you know um, it's like you know Saturn can. In other words, Saturn in an Earth sign like that cold, dry Earth sign in square to the um, Venus and Mercury in uh, Aries can be like, you know, um, the way that I hide the fact that I'm really a kind of a violent individual in mind and spirit is by being as principled and controlled as I possibly can. And that kind of dynamic can just be so toxic, right? But some of that might be exposed. Like you might start to notice in yourself, gosh, I'm actually really angry. And sometimes I use my principles and my structure and my type A personality and my and my my work drive and my work ethic to avoid an underlying irritation and frustration and level of you know self-loathing or criticism and judgment that I feel for other people and the way that I hide all of that intensity is just by you know by doing it cookie cutter I I walk through life as disciplined as possible I do the right thing and, and sometimes it doesn't work you can't you can't hide the fact that there's intensity and uh, anger and um, unresolved issues underneath the surface of the holding it all together. And this transit can also go the opposite direction where you lose control, right? You just can't hold it together anymore. So uh, those are some intense dynamics between Mercury, Venus, and Saturn. But the possibility for maturation and, and healthy, a deeper development of commitment and maturity in relationships as well, also in, in how we communicate to one another. March 17th, Mars enters Capricorn, which is going to be, a, you know, Mars is exalted in Capricorn. So there you've got Mars in a Saturn ruled sign, like the CEO of Capricorn. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's very hardworking and effective and driven and can also be really opportunistic. So you want to be careful that the work drive may step up a great deal. You might start feeling really good about what you're accomplishing and what you're doing from March 17th onward for about the next month. Um, and, uh, again, Mars and Capricorn can, you know, can, can bring it home. Right. But you also have to be really careful because it's a, it's a transit that can easily flip people out into self-righteousness, um, results equals mer the results that I generate in the material world equal my worth. Um, I am, I'm hardworking and I have, I have good intentions, right? Well, you know. Good intentions, as they say, you know, good intentions uh, pave the road to hell, right? And that's 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 a you know, it sounds kind of like harsh, but but that's actually true, right? We we end up in hellish places in our lives, oftentimes because we we mask selfishness and in good intentions, we mask opportunism and in good intentions. We say, oh my, you know, you're you're at a spiritual event, and you see someone who you know to be very successful in your same line of work and you say oh i'll just go sit next to them because they're they're you know and you're internally you're thinking like you know maybe i get some benefit you know maybe they'll they'll be able to i'll be i'll we'll be able to network with them you know um and you know that kind of thinking and then you you curl up next to them you know at the the at the banquet table and you and then you just start being as spiritual as you can possibly be you know as, as intelligent and, and you start you know so you start working it, in other words, and a lot of us do this all the time. It's 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 human. We just this is what we do. With Mars and Capricorn, it's just that much more of a temptation to do that kind of thing because there's that much more sort of giddy up in the position of Mars. So you want to be really careful of that while also taking advantage of the opportunity to put your best foot forward and um, uh, advance in spiritual life. Advancing in spiritual life is something that happens in and through all the other areas of our life. But, you know, use that that kind of, use this window that you're going to be feeling with Mars and Capricorn um, to work toward the things that matter, which oftentimes are not the results that people can see, but the results that, you know, really only God can see, only our, our, the indwelling spirit can see. Um, so pay attention to whose, whose judgment are you seeking approval you know, or whose judgment are you so concerned about with Mars entering Capricorn? Good stuff, just good stuff to think about. March 20th, spring equinox. Oh, 
how I love the spring equinox. I feel like it's just such a burst of that, you know, the sun is exalted in Aries, springtime energy. It's youthful, it's explosive, everything that's been gestating in, in Pisces, sort of longing in Pisces, suddenly can get like really clarified. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, it's epiphanic. I know where I'm going. That's where I'm going. Go, right? Just remember, um, where, wherever there's that new life and that burst forward, um, uh, just, just remember to take the long view. It's a long year. Aries lasts 30 days, and then you're right into Taurus where things are going to start slowing down again. Um, so just, just remember, one of the things that kills this, the opportunity of a, of a nice spring burst with Aries is trying to do too much too quickly, too many things, too many irons in the fire, or not being realistic and thoughtful enough about a long-term approach. Because it's like, okay, so let's, let's think about it like this. One day you wake up, and it's it feels like the day to do spring cleaning. Oh my gosh, I'm going to clean the whole house. I'm going to clean my basement. I'm going to clean the attic. I'm going to, you know, and here's what you do. You get so amped up. You're like, this is going to be so great. First, I'm going to make a massive meal of pancakes. And so then you you make a big <laughs> pancakes. I've been making a lot of pancakes lately. I got to say, I love, I love pancakes, especially now that I know how to make them. Something about being in India, I had some really good pancakes there, and then I came back, and I was like, I don't really know how to make pancakes very well. So then I put my, I put myself to it, and now I'm making a good pancake. Mostly, so you're ready to clean the whole house, everything, and then you're like, uh, before I commence doing everything in the entire house, I'm gonna have a big meal of pancakes. Eat the big meal of pancakes, and all of a sudden you're like, mm, energy comes down a little bit, right? <laughs> <laughs> which I've also been observing, don't have too many pancakes. <laughs> so then, you know, the energy is like, brrr, comes down a little bit. And then you're like, oh God, well, I better go to Home Depot and get all of my supplies. I got to get everything so that I can do all of it. All the things. You go to Home Depot, you spend $500, some crazy amount of money, right? And then you get back, you've got all your supplies. You, you're, you're at that point now, it's like past noon and you're like, oh man, like I need a siesta, you know, like I, I spent, it's like, it's been a lot, you know, my pancakes, my trip to Home Depot. And, and then it's like, okay, so then maybe by the end, of, by the end of the day, like you've managed to clean out a closet, you know what I mean? <laughs> and then the next day you're like, uh, well today I've got like lots of stuff to do. Ah, but I've got a free day on Saturday and this Aries energy, it's sun shining. Like I'll get back to it, you get back to it on Saturday. And then, you know, the same kinds of things happen that's life. Like that's how life actually works. Like there's nothing, you're not a failure. That's actually what happens all the time. Like we usually can't do as much as we set out to do at the burst of springtime, you know, like that's just how life is. It's sort of like when you're in the grocery store, you want all of the food because you're hungry. <laughs> you know, you get home, you eat a little bit of the food, <laughs> you know, and then you've bought like all the stuff. Same thing happens in sex life, right? And so, like, oh my God, I'm so, I just, I, I need some, I need like physical intimacy. I need to have sex. I'm like, I'm so, I, I want to just have like a million children right now. And that's how you're feeling. You're feeling really just super spring and so, like super horny, right? <laughs> and then what what happens, right? Um, maybe, you know, you, you have a partner, maybe they're feeling the same way. So you 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 get together and then afterwards you're like, yeah, that was, that was really great. You know, that was really great. But then your appetite, like you're like, yeah, I don't know if I want to have 10 kids or anything like that. Like I was, you know, I was just, I was just really desiring you, you know, <laughs> like, or you're like, you know, you the hunger goes away, like right, it, very instantly it satiates itself. That's the thing with Aries, you always have to remember, whatever you're desiring, you're craving, you'll satiate a little bit of it. And, and, and it'll go, it'll, the flame will die out very quickly. So be strategic with what you want to do and how you do it and, and, and take a long-term view of the situation. March 23rd, uh, Venus will square Pluto. Wow. So that's, you got the theme of death and rebirth in relationships big time. Uh, the, uh, anything in relationships that needs to be purged, cleansed, you know, healed, there, there's, there's something uh, lurking below the surface that needs to be exposed. <clears throat> watch Venus square Pluto and bring that stuff to the surface around March 23rd. March 28th, Venus will then conjoin Uranus and Aries. There's, 
innovation, rebellion, revolution, and love in relationships and style. I, I spoke to a woman the other day who had a Venus, uh, Uranus Venus transit, and she shaved her head, just totally cut off all of her hair, donated it to charity just because. She was like, I actually really wanted to do it. And I knew that I had to do it, but I thought people would think I was crazy. So I found a cause to basically mask my impulse. So I, I, she found a charity to give her hair to and raise some money for it, actually, even though underneath it was just purely just the desire to shave her head. So, you know, Uranus and Aries, I'm basically telling you, you'll, you may want to shave your head. But you get it. Rebellion, innovation, paradigm breaking, disruption, disruption of the status quo, uh, getting in touch with Venus, the goddess. And that's March 28th. And then March 31st, I believe the technical term for two full moons in a month is a blue moon. <laughs> uh, full moon on the March 31st. So I think we've had two blue moon months this year. Is that right? Uh, anyway, March 31st, it's a full moon in Libra. So you think all of this Aries energy blasting through, but then a nice dose of the, the diplomatic Venetian uh, qualities. And um, Venus will be entering Taurus right around the end of the month, beginning of, of uh, April. And once Venus is in Taurus, she's back in her home sign, and the, the whole mood and feeling of Venus will shift quite a bit. All right, guys, that's what I've got for you for now. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Um, I, I, uh, it's been a little bit crazy trying to get caught up with a lot of work since I've been back from India, so I haven't been doing as many videos, and I've been struggling to keep up even with my dailies because I'm digging myself out of a, a, a pretty big hole of work from both our yoga studio and, uh, obviously, all things astrology after being gone in India for like almost three weeks. So uh, I appreciate your patience. I know some people have been emailing me saying like, where are you? Where's, where's your videos? Stuff like that. Makes me feel good inside to know that people like it. So that's great. Anyway, um, I hope that you all have a uh, very beautiful month of March and thanks for tuning in. Take care. Bye.